This conference will now be recorded. All right, well, thanks for joining us today. Uh, we look forward to talking a little bit about our heritage of freedom and some current challenges to freedom. We'll continue talking next week more about some additional challenges to freedom that uh, we're currently facing in our society. Um, but since it is July 4th this week, we do want to focus and take a minute to really talk about some of the blessings we have with the freedoms that we've been given. I think it's important to recognize what our freedoms have done for us. And so um, we'll definitely give each person a chance if they want to share some thoughts about that. Um, let's see. To me, our freedoms are a gift. And I believe strongly that the more we come to understand freedom and the more we come to understand the importance of the heritage our founding fathers left us, that we'll be able to be a better force for good in the world, to help preserve freedom and to stand up for what's right. And I, I believe that each of us have a responsibility to take actions in our daily life to um, stand up for freedom and support freedom. So with that, um, I wanted to ask each of you, or some of you, not everyone has to answer if you don't want to, um, but what are, some, what are some of your thoughts on the, the blessings left to us by our founding fathers? What are some of the good things that you see there? <laughs> and Leah, maybe we'll give you a chance to, to go first with that. She might not be in a place to unmute. There she goes. We're good. Um, that's a good question. Oh, freedom. So let me repeat. So I'm looking at what freedom means to me and why. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, what it means to you or some of the blessings you see our founding fathers having given us. Well, I, I really been liking the the freedom of speech um and that that is just a blessing in itself because we all have different perspectives and the ability to say what you feel and and be able to know that you don't have to, you don't have to agree with other but that you can say how you feel to be able to share your thoughts so i'm grateful that he put that in there um right now with everybody voicing um, to know that they can voice without the violence, the voice and just your your ability to communicate. And, and communication is so important to me because it's something we haven't done in my own family growing up. We, we didn't talk and, and that's something I'm coming to understand a little bit more about um, to, to have that voice. You know, so many people have been trapped to be able to say what they feel because of other people's choices so anyway i just think that's one of the great blessings to be able to to communicate our thoughts and ideas yeah thanks for that i appreciate that sam what about you what are some of your thoughts um i've kind of just the constitution itself and its ability to um protect everyone at least the way that the constitution was meant to be. And and this, I mean, I've learned, I've been reading a book called The Lincoln Hypothesis, and it's talked a lot about the Civil War and the amendments 13 and 14 and how it gave the federal government power to, um, to enforce the constitution in the states to make sure that no min minorities were getting persecuted. Um, and it's just meaningful because that's, that's the, I mean, that's the, the amendment that Freed the slaves and protected them from abuse, and also it's the amendment that protected members of the Church of Jesus Christ. Um, they were they were being persecuted and they were driven out of the nation, um, but they were they came back into the nation after those amendments were passed, and and so it's it's I just like that. Um, all all protected um, and that they can't be targeted and killed and um, just because. They're different just because they're a minority. Um, 
it, the, America should be a land of safety, whether it's religion or your race, or um, and you shouldn't be targeted and killed just because of your minority. So uh, that's been on my mind lately. Awesome. Thanks, Sam. It is interesting to look at the 14th Amendment. Um, President Oaks, I think, referred to it as one of the a very inspired amendment because uh, it certainly did help a lot with some of the serious injustices that were taking place. Um, today, that you know, what was good is being used by Satan for uh, bad. And there's a lot of interesting things happening with the 14th Amendment anymore. Um, but it certainly had a very important role in America's history. And it is it is very interesting to look at that amendment and the, the inspiration behind it. And Elias, what about you? What are some of your thoughts? Um, I think given the nature of a lot of the things that are going on right now, I, we were left with a blessing in the right or um, to peaceably assemble. Um, you know, and worship to the dictates of our own conscience. I think, and I, when I'm thinking about what they left us, and I, I can go down and list freedoms, but I also think that they really left us a legacy, a legacy of courage, of, uh, of sacrifice as you have on here, of self-denial and foresight to be able to put their lives on the line, not knowing if they were going to be able to enjoy the freedoms that they were fighting for, but having a vision and a foresight for, not just for their own children and grandchildren, but for generations to come. Um, and that that's something that that dedication and that conviction and that resolve that they're going to do whatever it takes to protect those freedoms and to fight for them i yes there are a lot of freedoms specifically and i appreciate all those but that's something that i i think about all the time thanks i appreciate that and does anyone else have thoughts they'd like to share on freedom or the heritage left to us by the Founding Fathers? I do. Okay, go ahead. Well, um, I just have always, I don't know, Captain Moroni was always my favorite. Well, he was my first favorite Book of Mormon character because um, that courage and that love of freedom that he had just resonated so deeply in my soul because basically life sucks when you're not free. <laughs> so, um, and I also feel like being a teacher, I mean, the only thing I can think of that would be more difficult in this time would be to be a doctor or a nurse to, um, if you were, if you were fully awake to what's happening to our society, um, that's the only way, place I think I'd feel more um, compelled to do everything the opposite of good and to call evil good and good evil. But as a teacher, I feel like that's a really like a frontline trenches of where they're trying to um, push calling good evil and evil good because it just breaks my heart and I don't even know if I can I don't know how I'm going to handle it. If if I walk into that school and classroom, um, and when my do, when I do have students show because they're changing the whole makeup of how they're going to do school, but when I do have students, I mean I'm such a truth lover that for them to ask me to pretend that it's um, a same thing to do to put a mask on or wear a shield or whatever, or for the students to socially distance or not share. And those are such lies to me. And, and as a teacher, I, I feel my responsibility is to model truth and, um, 
and knowledge and sanity, not not the opposite. So to not have the freedom to do that in my job, it's horrific to me. So I'm feeling really nervous about the lack of freedom and lack of sanity all around me. So how do I blend those two statements? I started out talking about how um, Captain Moroni spoke to my soul and now you know, what would Captain Moroni do if he was a teacher in the public education system? <laughs> I wish I had the courage to be him, and I think I might. I certainly tried at the end of the year when I refused to wear the mask, and I did armor up with prayer, and it did work for two and a half weeks, but it was the end of school, so it's a much more daunting thing to to know how God wants me to handle things going into the fall. Yeah, it's always it's it's very interesting to see, you know, with with all the things that happen, it, it becomes complicated you know, knowing what to do. Um, the world makes us so there's a lot of pressures, a lot of forces at play, and we don't have just one one place to look. It's not just a oh, there's you know this very specific thing to do here. It's a it takes a lot of learning and a lot of prayer for sure to know what God wants us to do each day. And I, I definitely agree with that. And so one, one reason I really appreciate each person that calls in and engages in these discussions is that I think we can help each other. We can learn and grow and support each other because the cause of freedom is, um, is a great one. And there are so many forces at play in the world that we really need to help each other out. I don't think any one of us has all the answers. Um, and I think God intends for us to unite and be engaged in some basic level of unity, kind of like the founding fathers. They didn't agree on everything. They had sharp disagreements among themselves over some pretty big issues. Um, but in the end, they were able to unite on the things that were the most important. And I, I sincerely hope that that's something that we can do in our day and age to be able to unite on these important things and really help each other um, in this cause to to stand up in our spheres of influence, whether you know for you, you're a teacher or you know whether we're in a business or a um, employment setting or friend, family, you know whatever setting we're in, to be able to be that example and and to help preserve that. Yeah, so if any, anyone has any grand ideas of how I am asking the Lord uh, what he wants me to do, and I always think of how he did um, so often in scripture, we have examples of him using strategy. You know, I think of uh, Judges 7 with Gideon and the Midianites and how the Lord uh, actually sent away most of the army and left Gideon with like 300 men to defeat the Midianites. And it took a lot of faith for Gideon to know that the Lord was going to fight that battle. And um, he did it through stratagem. So I am wanting to think out of the box, like what strategy the Lord will tell me, but I'm open to any right ideas that anyone else has. And I've thought of just like, can I have an invisibility cloak, like just not comply but like be invisible to them that I'm not complying. Or, so any ideas? Yeah, I'd love it because for me, I'm very clear on, uh, I have like at least five major reasons why the mask is unacceptable. Um, and one is just, I mean, one of the most frightening ones, I mean, they're all frightening, but one of the most frightening to me is um, how in satanic ritual abuse or in the satanic groups, how the mask is a part of that. And so I feel like amongst all the other things that are wrong with the mask, I don't want to ever do anything that's like bending a knee to Satan. And, um, and, and even when we're fear based, we're worshiping Satan, not God, you know, God has given us this, not the spirit of fear. So those are things on my mind that I'm trying to work through. So open yeah. to ideas. No, we certainly appreciate your thoughts um, and willingness to to ask for help on that. Um, we will 
we are planning today to talk about a little bit with coronavirus and and some of the uh, issues there. And so some people may have some thoughts as we go forward um, with the discussion. I don't know if anyone has anything right now off the top of their head, but if not, we can keep moving forward and then see what, you know, if, if thoughts come to people or if we can connect afterwards too. Well, I have a comment if, yep. if it's appropriate to share. Yeah, I'm yeah. a nurse and I don't understand, like I don't, the government shouldn't force us to wear anything, but it is completely false that wearing masks is not helpful that is totally inaccurate i've seen the memes about putting up a chain link fence to keep mosquitoes out yes the virus is very very small but it can only be transmitted through droplets which are big the mechanism of transfer is through secretions and secretions can be um, avoided by covering up points of entry so it is 100% inaccurate to think even the homemade cloth masks or surgical masks, which are not as efficient as N95 masks, but masking is a very healthy way to protect yourself from points of entry, especially for people who are not as cognizant to keep their hands off their face. So we certainly appreciate that. Um... And I will say this, we don't, you know, we don't want to get into a debate today. I don't think about, you know, whether it's healthy or not. I think people have different views on that. And I'll, I'll just explain quickly, maybe where the different views come from, um, at least from what I can see. And, and again, we certainly appreciate the points. Um, so from what I see, when I walk into a store and see an employee wearing a face mask, for example, um, they are constantly touching it. You know, they're, they're touching their mask, adjusting it. You talk about the people that can't stop touching their face. Those same ones can't stop touching their mask. And then they touch everything else associated with what they're doing, whether it's my food or anything else. And so I think some people believe, well, if you're a trained surgeon or nurse and you're good at not touching your mask, you know, maybe that's helpful, but for everyone else, why are they always, why, why don't those droplets then get on their fingers or hands and, and transmit? And then I think part of the logic, too, that is um, hard is they say it can't be transmitted except on droplets. But those droplets also, but they say you can still get infected if you're wearing a mask. And so something's making it through the mask that's infecting people. Um, and so I think some people have tried the claims. I don't. I don't think. No, those are. Yeah, those are really good comments. I think the the droplets. I think people don't know how to wear a mask for sure, and they don't know. Like you stick your finger that has COVID in your on your fingers from whatever you're doing out in the public or at home, and put it in your eye. You, you can get it. It's any mucous membrane. So for sure, people aren't educated on how to protect themselves. But and then we don't need this to be a debate on the efficacy of wearing masks. But if you make a barrier, it prevents things from coming in. Like whether you build a wall around a country or you put a mask across your your second biggest mucous membrane. Like it is it is beneficial. And people for real don't do it well and they don't utilize it. I've seen people in public wearing gloves. And they're touching everything and touching their face and like those gloves serve no purpose so for sure there's a lack of education in the populace but it doesn't mean wearing masks has anything religious to it to be sensitive the health community and i believe the government isn't trying to introduce um like satanic religious rituals slowly it um but we don't I, I just i felt like i couldn't keep listening without saying masks are effective and it and no one else on the call can can believe me and that's fine but it's wearing masks if you can be safe with wearing a mask it is effective i do not believe the government should mandate that we wear masks and we should all have our individual liberty but it is a safe way to protect yourself and on, on that front one thing 
I do want to be clear on is I think people on the call will be on both sides of the mask issue. Um, because, and this is to me a very freedom based thing. I think that we have the absolute freedom to believe it's appropriate or believe it's not appropriate. We can look at it as, you know, supporting one form of um, ritual or not. Um, those are things that are inherent in the freedom discussion to say, at the end of the day, yes, we can we can talk and we can educate and we can go through things and both sides can present their views. But one of the beauties of freedom is that we get to take these these differing views and, and talk through them. And again, in this one, you know, I I would love to go into discussions on the masks and all the possibilities with them. I'm actually gonna try to write an article to talk about some of the concerns from a legal precedent perspective that I don't think are articulated much with the mask wearing um, and where that can lead to in the law. I think that's a big concern for a lot of people. And so yes, even if even if 100% of people today are truly good hearted and it's just for good reasons and purposes, once the law becomes involved in mandating it, it opens up a precedent and a whole can of worms that becomes very problematic. And those are those are some issues that um, you know, there's there there are some serious concerns with. And again, can I guarantee that those problems will happen? No. Um, but in watching the way that the law evolves, once the government comes in by force to say we all have to do something, there is a level of concern, no matter how benevolent that that becomes. Uh, but yes, on the mask wearing side, no. Would you want your surgeon to wear a mask? I think most people would say yes. Um, some people don't believe that we have. You know as much interaction or as much um, contact as society says we does we do and and again those are those are points that we can discuss um, and i'm not I'm not trying to minimize the legitimacy of either side there just to say here we want to talk about the freedom aspect a little and and uh, save some time for that so we'll we'll keep going appreciative of both who commented there um, it's always good to hear both sides of things and I really appreciate that in a freedom discussion. So thanks for sharing there. Um, but we want to go, I think one thing that's really interesting to look at and even following through, and this will get into the mask thing some too, not again on whether the masks are effective or not, but more on the law and the way America's set up. So I don't know how many of you have heard of the case of Marbury versus Madison. Uh, maybe it rings a little bell. Most people that have studied the case really struggle understanding it. It's a very difficult case to read and understand. Uh, even once you're an attorney, it's it's a very difficult case to get through. It's from 1802 or 1803, maybe 1803. And in this situation, John Adams uh, wasn't going to be reappointed to the presidency. Uh, Thomas Jefferson was taking over. So during that time, John Adams appointed a bunch of judges that he knew Jefferson wouldn't like. And under the law at the time, these judges would be appointed for five years. So they'd serve during all of Jefferson's term. Jefferson wasn't super happy about that. And he knew he didn't have the power to take away their appointment. Um, but he said, uh, I don't have to pay you though. I don't have to give you your commission. And so he ordered James Madison, as Secretary of State, not to pay these guys. So the case really talks about Marbury, even though three I think justice is sued um, to get their commission. And what they did is they filed their case in the Supreme Court. Um, so the case started in the Supreme Court and they were seeking a writ of mandamus, which means an order compelling Madison to uh, give the commission. So the Supreme Court was left looking at a couple issues. One, they had to look and see if Marbury was entitled to his commission. Um, and they went through a couple of things, but one thing that Madison said <clears throat> is he said, hey, Supreme Court, you don't have the power to even hear this case because Congress passed a law that said they could file this case in the Supreme Court. He said, but the Constitution didn't give you the right to hear this case in the beginning. Because um, he said that the Supreme Court has original jurisdiction in the Constitution, meaning a case can be filed there in only very limited situations. Um, so in this, there was a constitutional challenge presented to a statute. 
And so Madison essentially knew he was losing, that Marbury was entitled to the commission. Um, but Madison said, but Supreme Court, you can't hear this case because of the Constitution. And we'll, we'll talk about this because it, it forms part of the, the heritage um, that the country at least has followed since 1803. Um, and that leads us to interesting places today. And so the, the Supreme Court in looking at things, they're, they're kind of caught in a bind. Uh, Madison really backed them into an interesting corner because he said, Supreme Court, the Constitution didn't give you the power to hear a case, you know, as the, as the trier in the case. You only have appellate jurisdiction in this matter. Um, but Marbury said, uh, but Supreme Court, you don't have the express constitutional authority to determine whether a statute is constitutional or not. He said the Constitution didn't give you the ability to determine whether a statute is constitutional or not. So the Supreme Court stuck in this spot where you know, one of the first constitutional cases we have is um, Congress giving the Supreme Court power that the Constitution didn't give the Supreme Court. And so on the one hand, they say, you have to stick to the Constitution. And if you have to stick to the Constitution and can't do anything about it, then the Supreme Court can't declare the law unconstitutional because the Constitution didn't give them the power to declare the law unconstitutional. Um, but if they say, oh, we don't, we don't have to stick to the Constitution, we de can declare the law unconstitutional, then they would also be saying, well, then you know, Congress doesn't have to stick to the Constitution either. And so it was an interesting bind and conundrum for the Supreme Court. And as they looked at it, they said some of these things. Um, they said that the people have an original right to establish for their future government. Let's see. Such principles as, in their opinion, shall most conduce to their own happiness is the basis on which the whole American fabric has been erected. This original and supreme will organizes the government and assigns to different departments their respective powers. It may either stop here or establish certain limits not to be transcended by those departments. So he's saying, no, we're not, we're not supposed to go past the limits that the Constitution gave us. Then he says, the government of the United States is of the latter description, meaning we're not supposed to go past the limits. The powers of the legislature are defined and limited, and that those limits may not be mistaken or forgotten, the Constitution is written. To what purpose are, po are powers limited, and to what purpose is that limitation committed to writing, if these limits may at any time be passed by those intended to be restrained? The distinction between a government with limited and unlimited powers is abolished if those limits do not confine the persons on whom they are imposed, and if acts prohibited and acts allowed are of equal obligation. It is a proposition too plain to be contested that the Constitution controls any legislative act repugnant to it. So the Supreme Court is saying, you know, no way, we can't, we can't take this case here because it goes against the Constitution. It said it's clearly limited us. Um, and then, though, to answer the question of, well, do we have the power to declare something constitutional or not? Because the Constitution also didn't give us that power. They said this. They said, is it, it is emphatically the province and duty of the judicial department to say what the law is. Those who apply the rule to particular cases must of necessity expound and interpret that rule. If two laws conflict with each other, the courts must decide on the operation of each. So this is their logic. They say, so if a law be in opposition to the Constitution, if both the law and the Constitution apply to a particular case, so that the court must either decide that that case conformably to the law, disregarding the Constitution, or conformably to the Constitution, disregarding the law, the court must determine which of these conflicting rules governs the case. This is the very essence of judicial duty. So the Supreme Court here used two words to describe why they had the power to do constitutional review, even though the Constitution didn't give it. They used the term necessity, um, and they used the term essence. They said that must of necessity expound and interpret, and this is the very essence of judicial duty. And what this boils down to is that the Supreme Court, in looking at things, said there's no other way for the Constitution to work unless 
essentially they're saying unless one branch of government somewhere has the ability to be the final say on what's constitutional and what's not constitutional. They say it's necessity. And so the Supreme Court said, uh, yeah, the Constitution prohibits us from having this case filed in the court originally. Um, so we can't we can't help you, Marbury. Um, but they said, but there's no other way for us to function unless we can declare a law unconstitutional. And so we're going to take that power. They said it's basically implied. So it's this interesting thing that they did where they said, one, the Constitution has to give you the power expressly. And they said, except in the cases where it's absolutely necessary to take the power. So what this means for America um, and what the court recognized it meant even is that their power always um, existed in their ability to convince America that they were right. It was a very much a respect aspect that they needed to have respect of the people so that people would follow what they say. Because at the end of the day, when they declare a law unconstitutional, there's no power or mechanism in the constitution for the court to enforce anything. It's up to the executive branch to enforce the orders of the court. And so the court for years, hundreds of years, took on a role of being above reproach, where they would try hard to be independent, not involved in politics and just look at the law and what it was. Um, and America developed a deep respect for the Supreme Court over the hundreds of years. And even this decision, it was interesting uh, because at the end of the day, the Supreme Court had no power to enforce it other than to say, we won't take your case, Marbury, um, because it, it violates the Constitution. But that that leads us to a place where the American heritage we currently have is based on a deep respect for law, a deep respect for the Constitution and the separation of powers that existed there. Um, and Chief Justice Roberts in 2015, he still recognized this. He says the legitimacy of this court ultimately rests upon the respect accorded to its judgments. Um, because at the end of the day, the court has no express constitutional provision that gives it the power it has. It's a power the court took out of necessity, they said, because it was expedient. Um, but it's, it's very much the basis and the hallmark for how America currently operates. The laws are all built um, on, this, on this deep respect. So the question is, when we talk about challenges to freedom today, is the deep respect inherent in the Marbury versus Madison decision being challenged today? Um, and is that a good or a bad thing that's happening? So I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. If you see challenges to respect, and if you see it as being good or bad. You don't have to answer the good or bad question if you don't want to either. I, I think this is really interesting. I'm still trying to mull it over. <laughs> yeah, so we're, we're gonna talk a little um, about this because here's, here's just some scenarios. Um, the Supreme Court in the desegregation era when they were trying to desegregate public schools. They issued an order and it said, hey, Arkansas, you have to integrate the schools. Arkansas had actually, um, they were having so much unrest and violence over bringing uh, black children into school at that time. They said, there's no way we can do this. We can't keep the kids safe. Um, and those decisions went up and the Supreme Court issued an order and said, no, you have to desegregate. 
And Arkansas said, Supreme Court, you have no authority to say that. You can't order us to do this. That's outside your authority. We're not going to follow, essentially. And so the federal government came in. Uh, the president sent troops in, National Guard type things. And the troops actually went to the schools and um, basically uh, compelled these schools to allow these, these children into them. Um, and it was a mess. I mean, it was a chaotic time, lots of issues. Um, but at the end of the day, if the president of the United States had been of the same opinion as the governor of Arkansas, the president of the United States could have said, well, Supreme Court, you issued an order going for short order. I'm not going to. And what would have happened to the country if we started on this path of the president saying, you can't do anything to me, Supreme Court, so you know, good luck. Uh, good luck enforcing your decision. And it's, it was a very, it was a time of great testing um, to see the, the court issue an order and states start to refuse to follow it until the government came in, the federal government came in. But again, if you're at a place where the federal government president decides, I don't wanna do anything either, because I don't respect that decision, the whole fabric of our freedom and heritage starts to fall apart. Uh, because then, even if you have constitutional rights and you win in court, um, you don't have an executive department that enforces those. You know, what do you do at that point? How does the country continue to function? And so again, the, the Supreme Court, when they in Marbury versus Madison, when they took this, this power based on expediency to say, ooh, We've got to be the final interpreter. The, they knew the only way it would work is if they could convince the executive department every single time to follow their decision. Because if the executive department didn't want to follow their decision, the court was powerless to enforce anything. Um, and so with America today, there are, there are, in my opinion, intense attacks on the deep respect of Marbury versus Madison. I believe strongly that there are people that understand very well how to undermine, undermine freedom and the, and the role of the Constitution. And they can destroy it through destroying respect for the Constitution and respect for the rule of law that's been created. The Supreme Court anymore is become incredibly politicized. Um, we're voting for presidents based on Supreme Court picks because Supreme Court justices will make or break most constitutional freedom, not most constitutional freedoms, they'll make or break important constitutional freedoms for people on either side. And, uh, and when that happens, we're, we're losing faith that the Supreme Court's making a reasoned decision. America is quickly losing faith that the Supreme Court is making a reasoned decision. And we're looking at it as, well, they made their decision because they were this appointee or that appointee. Um, they're very much deeply entrenched in political ideologies. And as we wage that war and that battle continues, um, the respect continues to erode. Um, but it's not just at the Supreme Court level that that respect is being challenged. Um, you know, we'll, we'll get into some things here. And this, this goes into the coronavirus things a little, and it's it's a concern I have with coronavirus and the government response. Um, when I when I look at the fabric of freedom in America, for example, whether or not you believe a mask does anything um, or is crazy helpful, the government says, Austin, when you walk into a restaurant in Salt Lake County, you need to have a mask on. You need to have it on when you sit down. But so long as you're eating something, you don't need it. Now, my question when I look at that is I say, you know, you're coming in with force a lot to force people to do things they don't want to do. Are you really protecting anybody in a restaurant? I can sit there for three hours in a restaurant without a mask on, as long as I continue to put a French fry in my face um, occasionally. You know, what if I'm eating a bite of food every five minutes or 10 minutes? And I, I often have business meetings at restaurants and they often last two to three hours. Um, and so the question is, is there even, 
for that kind of rule to for the government to get so specific to say for those few minutes you're waiting for your food you need a mask but for the rest of the time you don't is there is there legitimacy to that and again we can say there might be some it you know it controls it a little bit um but at the end of the day i think a lot of people look at that and say well that's just crazy the government's just taking power at that point um, because it's not rational to them and when the laws start defying rationality we start losing a lot of respect in utah gyms were allowed to reopen before churches were allowed to meet again um you know another super interesting thing where we talk about the disease or spread of disease these are very specific things where they actually chose gyms and allowed them to reopen. Um, and I know I've I've been to church a couple times since it reopened, and <laughs> everyone's so far apart and things that I think I have way better chance of getting coronavirus in a grocery store than at church. Um, you know, but these are restrictions that are there. One that blew my mind is lawyers were classified as essential. So. I had a client with a will and trust and they ran a, a care center. And I walked into the care center with their will and trust, signs all over the door. It says no family allowed, no friends allowed, no visitors except for essential workers. They let me write in. And I looked at that and I said, am I really essential? More essential than this person's family? Um, that, that just blew my mind. And for for court, if you had a court case, a criminal case, anything, jury trials, trials canceled, all these trials and hearings canceled, and the courts almost completely shut down. And so when we start going into this rational side of things, I understand that it's hard to make a call on everything. Um, but these ones are are so specific; they come down so specific on these that it starts to really undermine credibility and the more we undermine credibility the more we challenge this um, this basis of freedom where people start to believe that we're doing it for some other reason because they can't see the rational connection between what's happening um, and so another thing i think that undermines respect is before legislatures would meet and they'd have these big rooms and there'd be this you know this presence they're in these sessions and they have all these rules they follow and the rules and the forum they give respect to the process um, but now our legislatures are meeting and passing laws online just on a i don't know what they use zoom or who knows what some online platform that they're they're meeting on we can watch it um but we don't have this place to create this presence of respect for these laws that are being passed. And we don't have the ability to go talk to them. When I go up to the Capitol and a representative has to talk to me face to face and I tell them, hey, you're doing the wrong thing here, it makes it incredibly uncomfortable for them. If I send them a text or an email, they can choose to ignore any one of those. Um, and I, I lose a lot of ability here to be an influence when they're meeting and passing laws online. And this process of saying, well, we're just gonna get together online and pass a bunch of laws that significantly affect people, it starts to really undermine the credibility of the process and the system. People are getting cut out. Um, and when this respect is lost, we start to, American, the, the, the freedom fabric starts to break down a lot. Um, and so something I, I push consistently for is I say, we need to have you know, principles we follow. If, if you're going to believe something, at least do it principally, you know, at least do it in a way that people can understand. They can, they can at least see what you're doing. Um, but here, when we're saying, yeah, if you're a lawyer and you need a will and trust, they can get into the care center or the hospital and give that to you. But if you are a Catholic and you want your last rites read to you as one of the ordinances before you die, you're not allowed to have that, that priest come in. Um, you know, these things are, are calls that you know, are, are dangerous for the government to be making because 
they they really undermine this this respect for the rule of law. Um, so I, I don't know if any of you have thoughts on the respect aspect still. Again, we we focus on it only with coronavirus. With some of the to me, this is one of the current challenges, is to say to say we need to really drill down on you know, what this what this looks like and what it can be. Um, but to understand that we can't we can't just have laws passed. Another area where there's a ton of respect being lost is when a governor or a mayor just issues an order, an executive order to shut things down. People ask me all the time, don't laws have to be passed by the legislature and the executive branch? And when governors and mayors just issue orders and close entire sets of businesses and things and uh, based on a tenuous executive power, it's it's very problematic for the rule of law because people start saying, well, it's not a law. I don't have to follow it, it's not a law. Um, and when the government has things that look like laws and things that don't and back and forth, and people start picking and choosing what they follow and what they don't, the whole system starts to fall apart. So to me, this, this respect issue is one of the big challenges to, um, one of the big challenges to respect and our freedom fabric that runs. And I, one of the founding fathers you know, they talk about how the constitution was designed for immoral people or you know, they have a republic if they can keep it. Um, and I think they knew at the end of the day that the morality they talk about was one of, would we unite together? Would we stay together? Would we fall behind the decisions made or the results that have happened? to keep our country together because again at some point with the checks and balances if every branch starts to oppose each other um, and people start to oppose those the whole system starts to fall apart um, so we'll we'll go on here to another another challenge to freedom in addition to the respect and one thing I see happening quite often is that we say as people, um, something bad happened. We need to make sure that never happens again. We have a fear of harm that's pervaded our mentality here. Now, it's interesting, the court in Marbury versus Madison said, yeah, Marbury's out commission, but there's nothing I can do about it. I'm not gonna help you, sorry. And it's, you know, it's it's an interesting result. And but the question is, should the government attempt to mitigate any harm that may happen? If something bad happens, should the government pass a law to make it illegal that it happen again? What are your thoughts on that? Not necessarily. Probably more no. Bad things happen all the time, but it's not the gut. It's not within uh, the authority and the power granted to the government to safeguard the people from all the bad things that could and will happen. Okay, Leah, did you have thoughts there? I did. Uh, my personal opinion is. Education is power. And the ability to choose once educated, then you get to learn from experience. Um, I was a mom that wanted to force my kids to do what's right. I wanted to protect them from any harm, from any bad things happening. And that wasn't a great way to govern. <laughs> because they didn't get to have an experience to learn and understand from and I think it's the same way with our government. You know, when an issue is brought to, um, let's just take the seatbelt laws. Seatbelts save lives, right? And it's a good thing to wear a seatbelt. And I, I'm grateful that I've been educated. But I think it still should be a, a choice, not a law. But that's just one one. And so that's to kind of share my point. Yeah, thank you. 
Um, and certainly, as we you know think about this question, there are certain harms. I think the government's role, the government is properly involved in trying to address some harms. You know, we talked at the first. Sam talked about uh, slavery and the uh, pioneers that were kicked out of the country, essentially expelled. You know, extermination order issued in Missouri. Um, those are types of harms that. The government's very interested, I think, appropriately in addressing. Um, but there are many harms. We're getting to the point where we don't, we can't tolerate when one person's injured or one person bad thing happens, and we want laws passed. We're turning to the government as our source of complete justice to say, you know, um, to to take these on, and so. I wanted to share with you just some language from the case of Obergefell versus Hodges. This was the same sex marriage case the Supreme Court took up in 2015 that granted constitutional rights to gay marriage, essentially. They said the Constitution uh, requires gay marriage. And it, it was really interesting for me to read it as a, from an attorney's perspective and to see the legal basis that the government chose. You know, no matter what you believe about the appropriateness of um, gay marriage being in the Constitution, we're going to focus on the, the legal basis that the that the Supreme Court went on, the, the precedent they set and the foundation they established of why they said it was in the Constitution. Um, so they said the state itself makes marriage all the more precious by the significant it attaches to it. So it says the government's what's made marriage such a special thing. So they say exclusion from that status has the effect of teaching that gays and lesbians are unequal in important respects. And then the Supreme Court says this, it demeans gays and lesbians for the state to lock them out of a central institution of the nation's society. Same-sex couples too may aspire to the transcendent purposes of marriage and seek fulfillment in its highest meaning. Laws excluding same-sex couples from the marriage right impose stigma and injury of the kind prohibited by our basic charter. Under the Constitution, same-sex couples seek in marriage the same legal treatment as opposite-sex couples, and it would disparage their choices and diminish their personhood to deny them this right. Now, um, the, the Supreme Court here went on a basis to say, ooh, state, you've made something really special. You've created this institution of marriage. Um, and because you created this and it's so special, it hurts people's feelings and poses the stigma and injury on them to keep them out of it. Um, and at the end of the day, if you read through the dissenting opinions, you know, they are they are fairly clear on this to say, yeah, the Supreme Court here has said because someone wants something and they feel hurt because they don't have it, the government's required to give it to them. You know, it's just a foundational principle that the Supreme Court adopted to say, yeah, we're gonna give it to them because marriage is a pretty cool thing and it, it hurts people's feelings to not have marriage. They didn't, they didn't go through all the rights because of the rights, for example, with marriage, states were starting to give same-sex couples the same legal rights afforded to married couples. Um, California had done that, but it was, but they came and said, no, this marriage thing's still so special. Um, but what's happening here, from my perspective in the law, is we're, we're embracing this mentality where we fear to harm someone, we fear to hurt somebody's feelings. And at the end of the day with marriage, <clears throat> my wife and I, our union itself has produced seven children. Those children are a direct result of our union. My union can continue on past the grave. I have children, well, I have grandchildren most likely, and great grandchildren and other things. And that's a union that just, whether you believe in God or not, by sheer nature exists. I have something that a same sex couple won't ever have. And I don't say that in a demeaning way, just talking about it from a physical perspective. Their union itself can never perpetuate. So maybe it's, you know, maybe, maybe not marriage is the way to talk about it. But at the end of the day, 
it's impossible for us to give them the same thing that I have because <clears throat> I, I have a union that can go on. Um, I can't give them to that in the law or not. But because they felt hurt that, you know, they, they had that stigma on them, the law gave it to them. And the concern here is that we, the law is moving away from reasoned approaches and just saying, hey, if you feel hurt, if there's something you want that someone else has, then we'll we'll give it to you. Because we want to address this this hurt and this harm. And in our society, we're, we're racing aggressively to address all kinds of hurts and all kinds of harms and all kinds of feelings and things. Um, and it's leading to an undermining of freedom and an undermining of respect for the system. Uh, because at the end of the day, we start to take on things that aren't aren't entirely true. Um, and it, it, when we do that and we ask people to to do things they don't feel are true and we require it by force of law, we start to undermine this respect because of this fear we have of harming. Um, but to go on, I just wanted to quote a couple things. We're nearly out of time here. Um, but this is a very troubling thing I've been hearing lately, this first one. I have a right to be free of a virus. With the, with the mask um, push where people want to mandate it through government use. And again, this is outside of whether a mask is effective or not. We're just talking pure legal precedent. When someone says, I have a right to be free of a virus, and I even had a super educated lawyer. I mean, this guy is super smart. And he said this on Facebook. He said, I have a right to be free of a virus. I went, whoa, take a minute there. Think about what you're saying. If you have a right to something, what does it mean? It means that the rest of the people by force of law are compelled to, to give you that. You know, where do viruses come from? Now, if we have a right to be free of a virus, can you imagine telling God that? Saying, hey, I can't get sick. I have a right to be free of this. Um, the, the notion that we have a right to be free of a virus is incredibly dangerous, I think, to legal precedent. Because what that starts to do is it starts to bleed into tort law, which we talked about before. It starts to bleed into a bunch of areas that are very dangerous, where businesses now become obligated to keep their employees and customers safe. How do you truly keep someone safe from a virus? If I can sue my employer because I got sick, um, think of the precedent that's going to set. You know, coronavirus, whether we believe coronavirus is more or less deadly or the same as the flu, you know, no matter what we believe about that. So I get the flu so I can sue for it, you know, and and what this does is it creates intense fear among society. I'm going to be terrified to come close to anyone, to talk to anyone, to interact with anyone, because if they accuse me of giving them a virus, because they have a right to be free of it, then they can come take my property, they can come punish me, they can do something else because they got sick. At the end of the day, viruses are viruses. Um, yes, humans definitely carry them, and they, they jump from human to human, and there are things we can do to help you know, slow that spread or be smarter. But when it comes down to a legal precedent, if we're going to impose a right to be free of a virus, we're going to create a fear so deep and intense among people, it will break down all interaction among ourselves. You know, it's getting sick is one of the risks of life. And when the government starts stepping in to say, we have to control this, we have to, you know, we don't want anyone to die. Yes, that's a bad thing that we're fighting something that is creating fear and not faith and unity among people. We're, we're dividing people against each other. Where now, if you have children, how many children do you see in the store? Very few. People are terrified to take their children to the store. Terrified because kids are seen as a carrier of a virus. And this, this notion that people have a right to be free of a virus is becoming very perfect, pervasive. Um, and very detrimental to society and freedom. And the notion that businesses can be liable um, if someone gets sick there is, it's an incredible burden for a business to carry if you're gonna invite someone in. 
and to think about moving forward under this level of responsibility and standard is it's a huge weight to shackle America with, a huge weight to shackle individuals with. Again, I'm not I'm not saying that we should go out and just um, you know, cough on everyone and make everybody sick, but the, these notions that stem from fear um, are very very against freedom. So I don't know if anyone has any thoughts there before we before we end for the day. It is two minutes over here, but um, so, I haven't listened to the whole thing. Um, but uh, I'm gonna as soon as we say that someone has a right to be virus free, then it's a very short step to say that we can mandate someone has that the the government can mandate what we take to be virus free. Um, so I'm just going to quickly go to like fluoride, fluoride in the water that was has been done through most of Utah. I think 77% of Utahns are on water systems that have fluoride. Uh, as soon as we, as as a people, start saying the government can do something like that, well. What's even better than fluoride? It's vi vitamin C. Do we start mandating people get vitamin C? Um, do we start mandating people get? Uh, so if they have the right to say we can wear, we have to wear masks, we have to have fluoride in our water, um, then they start saying in order to be healthy you have to have uh, milk or you have to have vitamin D or you have to have um, this particular food. Let's uh, let's just say that it's. Uh, um wheatgrass or something like that and the government starts mandating those things that will then on top of that how do they allow the ability for people to take it or take money out of our pocket pocket so that can happen uh so that's the the slippery path i think we're going down um and uh, along with I walk outside, I don't know that I've been sick or exposed to anybody with COVID-19. I find out a month later, I've got COVID-19 and someone may have got sick from me. I'm now legally responsible for that. I think it sets up a very slippery slope. Absolutely. And one that's very, very dangerous to freedom when we when we live by this fear and when we want to stop all harm. Uh, Again, we, we can promote good practices. We can say, hey, we feel vitamin C is healthy or vitamin D or fluoride, great. Give me all the information you want on it. But at the end of the day, um, let me decide. Because if you can put something in my water, um, it gives you the power to put most anything in the water. There's no check and balance on what they can put in there. There's no check and balance on the health aspects they can require. Um, the things that they start to do to, you know, to push and people have serious disagreements on some areas of health and whether it's scientific or not, whether it's freedom based or not, once you get into the realm of compulsion, it breeds hate. Compulsion and force always breed hate and anger and disrespect. And that always, always is part of the destruction of the foundation of freedom. And so founding fathers, one of the first principles they enshrined in the Bill of Rights that people said, hey, you left this out. One of the biggest things was freedom of speech. We have a duty and a responsibility if we believe something to go teach it, to go share it, to help convince others, to let others you know, show us the error of our ways. But at the end of the day, when we resort to force, um, and just stepping into these realms of that cause this disrespect or cause this fear to become greater, it's dividing us more. And we need to live by faith. We need to recognize that, yeah, bad things can happen, um, but it's not the government's job to take care of everything. So those are those are some of the takeaways from today. Um, you know, talking about current challenges. Next week we will talk more about these current challenges. Um, we'll continue this this line of discussion with the um, a lot that's happening with the, a lot of the tangents or other outgrowths of the Black Lives Matter movement to understand the legal precedent again we don't have to 
you know, it's not a place to we're going to agree or disagree on everything and the merits of everything they say. It's more to say we're going to look into that to see legally what's happening and legally the fabric of freedom, um, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing with that. But to me, um, and you don't have to agree with this, but to me, the takeaway is simply fear and the push to stop all harm is really, really driving us to a place um, where we're going to lose freedoms and very important freedoms. And I think we need to really stand up for the fact that bad things happen, yes. And we can be compassionate, we can be merciful, we can be charitable, we can reach out and help people. But we can't, we can't stop everything. There's simply no way to. And that's not a world we want to live in where we're to the place where we can sue our neighbor because we got sick. That is just not an America we want to live in. So I appreciate your time today. I hope you have a very happy um, Independence Day. And I would really encourage you to take a stand and stand up for some of these things. We'll be doing a Freedom Drive um, on Saturday. Would love to have you. We have a we're out in Salt Lake County and Utah County right now. You know, we can add others. Um, but come out and celebrate a little bit. Let's show people we still believe in freedom. Let's let's talk these things. Again, we don't have to agree on everything to agree on freedom. And um, and we can work through the other issues later, kind of like the founding fathers, but we can unite and start to make a force for good. Um, so. Hey, uh, Austin. Yeah. Do you know how many, have you kind of gotten a feel for how many people are going to be in the Utah County Drive? Um, so far, we're probably, at least that I know of, we're at um, uh, probably about 10 or 15. Um, but it's still circulating and still getting added to different groups and things like that. And so at the end of the day, I expect it to continue to grow. Most of the time, people don't commit until right before. Okay. Well, that sounds good. Ten cars going through is better than nothing. Yep. <laughs> um, hey, I put a link on there. I don't know if you can still hang on to it after the meeting's over or not. But um, have you seen that thing with um, have you seen that thing with Yuri, the KGB guy, that describes how you basically uh, deconstruct a, a free society? I, I haven't seen that one specifically. No. I think you'd really be interested in it. He um, he breaks it down into four stages. And if you look back on our history and where we're at now, he pretty much well predicts it. You know, he talks about um, demoralizing the community and how you have to uh, make them feel like their way of life is wrong, uh, which he said takes, I think, 15 to 30 years. It takes a full generation at least of educating. And we've had well over that where we were told America's bad and you know, our values are not good and stuff. Anyway, um, I won't go through all the stages, but if you if you watch it, you'll see that we're you'll see where we're at. It's pretty fa pretty fascinating. It's like um, I think it's like 13 minutes of your time. Okay, thanks for providing that. Did you send that to everyone? I what did send that. I did send that to everyone, but. Um, well, maybe I will just mention, um, I, th I think stage three is crisis, keeping the population in continual crisis. Um, and then um, you finally go to what is called normalization. And we've probably been through several rounds of this, you know, with the whole 9-11 and the Patriot Act and terrorism and schools being shot and stuff. And now now the crisis, the continual crisis is health crisis, but it's really quite ingenious and brilliant because um, of the control you can have when, when you're talking about health. Like you said, it becomes so all pervasive. It's just ultimate control. Yeah, our, our health does touch on everything. And you know, it is a, a serious concern. We are, I have been launching an effort to promote freedom and help. Um, yeah, and 
and the final stage, um, the final stage being normalization, I just find that ironic where they keep pushing that we're going to a new normal. It just totally fits stage four of normalization. Anyway. Yeah, they they're, they're very expressed in their terms, so they're they're definitely changing things. All right. Well, I just wanted to make sure you had a little background on why that I, well why I added that link. I think I think it's super informative. And by the way, ironically. That was, um, he, he, he made that, or he had that interview back in 1984, yeah. along with the book 1984. Yeah, that which all, which all, what's that? So that was quite the year for some reason. <laughs> yeah, anyway, but thank you. That was really awesome. And I, yeah, I do strongly, strongly believe we get, we get the freedom to think differently. Well, we hope we do. Yeah, we need to maintain that, right? For sure. So have a good day. Thanks, everyone. Hey, Austin. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Um, are we, I'm, I'm assuming we're not doing the Friday uh, constitutional meeting. Is this, are these Wednesday?